on this edition of Independent Sources, Mobilizing the Asian Vote, an agency's effort to empower one of the city's largest ethnic groups. We're not trying to segregate down here. We're trying to desegregate Albany. All right? We're trying to desegregate Washington, D.C., where there is no diversity. And escaping Afghanistan, an American woman's fight to flee that country after virtually being enslaved by her husband's family. When I talk about being held in captivity, it's like being under house arrest in a very lovely home. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Zyphus Lebrun. For years, the Chinese community was thought to be politically passive, but what seemed like the largest Asian group in New York City being apolitical was actually a methodical process of laying down the foundation for successful citizenship drives, voter registrations, and turnout. That's resulted in a growing number of Asians flexing their political muscles over the last few years. This year, a record 22 Asian candidates vied for congressional seats in 12 different states, including New York. That's a notable jump from 2008, when 13 candidates ran for congressional office. The Asian American Legal Defense Fund has been a big part of the organizing here in New York. The AALDEF has partnered with scores of organizations in an effort to ensure Asian voters' rights are not trampled and candidates have the sophistication necessary to win elections. We spoke to the organization's staff attorney, Jerry Vatamala, about how they've been trying to get out the Asian vote. We had to fight here at ALDEF at every redistricting cycle to keep Asian American communities together. We had our first victory with Flushing at the assembly level. We were finally able to have Flushing be drawn whole into one assembly district. And guess what? No surprise, that was the first district to elect an Asian American representative to the state assembly. Jimmy Meng was the first person elected to uh, the state assembly of Asian, with Asian ancestry. His daughter was the first Asian American elected yes. to Congress in 2012. Okay, and again, it's from that, that district centered in Flushing. She was in the congressional level. And again, that was through a redistricting victory. Mm -hmm. right. One thing people need to know is that here in New York City, we do our exit poll to ask people how they're voting. Data shows this city has racially polarized voting. People vote for the candidate that looks like them. So if your community is divided into numerous districts, even if everybody comes out to vote, they can never elect the candidate of that community's choice. And that's the, what we saw with the Asian community. And no surprise, when redistricting is fair and the districts are drawn in a way that keeps communities together, then the community can elect candidates of their choice. So what happened? Uh, at the city council level, John Liu, the first ever Asian American elected to city council because the district was drawn fairly. Here, uh, just here in Manhattan, um, we had uh, Margaret Chin that was, that was elected to city council. And again, because Chinatown was mostly kept whole, um, some of the surrounding districts weren't drawn the way that we'd like, but at least Chinatown was kept together. So the community has realized, oh, wait a second, when we have a chance of electing a candidate of our choice, they come out in great numbers. One thing we do is every Friday we go down to the federal courthouse and we register newly naturalized citizens and uh, have them register to vote. We have workshops, training workshops with, that we do with community-based organizations on how to do voter registration, how to do get out the vote, and how to still uh, work within their 501c3 status. We also do this community education uh, program through our training where we educate all our volunteers on what voters' rights are on election day and things like that most people don't know uh, that if you're not registered in a party, you can't vote in the primary, at least here in New York. And uh, we, we go over that in our training and, and, and have people spread the word uh, after doing our training. We have 550 volunteers this year, all right, and the vast majority of those are, well, more than half, are right here from New York. Right? So all those people that receive the training from us, we're hoping that they go out and spread the word to people in their community uh, and, and have them volunteer with us and have them register and educate the voters uh, in their own communities. We are sometimes accused of trying to segregate right, or balkanize things. But what we like to say is we're not trying to segregate down here. We're trying to desegregate Albany. All right? We're trying to desegregate Washington, D.C., where there is no diversity. Right? Where are all the Asian American elected officials? That process is happening all throughout Queens and Manhattan and Brooklyn. I'm seeing that process that happened in Queens starting to happen in Brooklyn. 
people are understanding that they need to naturalize, they need to register, and they need to come out to vote. Uh, that's somewhere where maybe Queens was 10 years ago. And everybody in Queens knows what, what they need to do now, because we have the groups out there on the ground, and people are coming out to vote. Still to come on the show, the story of an American woman fighting for her freedom after being trapped by her husband's family in Afghanistan. Before that, Crystal Lowe has some other news. Thanks, Cyphus. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. El Diario reports on the pro-immigrant activist fear that a new bill introduced by council member Andy King could lead to the deportation of several costume workers. The bill that requires costume individuals working for tips or any kind of compensation in public spaces to obtain licenses. A person who applies for the license must submit fingerprints. These fingerprints could in turn be shared with immigration and custom enforcement records to determine if the person should be deported or not. Individuals who do not apply for the license face fines of $1,000 or risk up to three months in jail. Various council members, such as Yadanis Rodriguez and Jalissa Ferreras, says they don't support the bill because of these concerns. However, council member Rafael Espinal, one of the bill's 23 co-sponsors, says that the bill could be modified to eliminate fingerprinting. As of now, the bill needs a minimum of 26 votes in the city council to pass. New York City's public pay phones are getting ready for a major upgrade. The city recently announced its partnership with CityBridge to develop a new payphone design that will revolutionize free and accessible telephone communication throughout New York City. Payphones will be replaced with links that will use a touchscreen tablet interface, a keypad, and a jack for headphones in replacement of the receiver for making calls. Links will also offer Wi-Fi service, cell phone charging, and information on city services and maps. City Bridges contract requires the equitable distribution of up to 10,000 units in all five boroughs specifically targeting low-income communities who don't receive sufficient wireless internet access. City Bridge LLC will begin construction in late 2015. From the Manhattan Times, the New York City Department of Probation has launched a project called NEON that offers young people in New York City, including those on probation, the chance to explore the arts through projects such as music, poetry, dance, and visual arts. The project sponsors a 12-week filmmaking course in the South Bronx at the Maisel Documentary Center. Participants receive a crash course on documentary filmmaking, where they are provided with cameras to film a subject of their choosing. They are then taught how to use editing equipment to create their final pieces. The Maisel Center also offers a junior filmmakers course, where children aged 10 to 13 learn the basics of filmmaking and how to create their own documentaries. The project also sponsors a weekly poetry workshop titled Free Verse that many of the film students also attend. For more information on class scheduling and availability, go to mazels.org slash mdc slash education. And finally, Voices of New York reports on the unveiling of All Races, All Faces, a guide to New York's immigrant communities a book offering a comprehensive listing of community-based nonprofit organizations that provide social services, cultural programming, and advocacy. Bertha Lewis, the founder and president of the Black Institute, says the book will also include information about the Diversity Immigrant Visa Program, which is a program that awards permanent residency to applicants from certain countries on an annual basis. The book is available for free in exchange for a voluntary donation at the Black Institute, located in Manhattan. Those are just a few headlines from the city's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be right back. Thanks for staying tuned. An American Bride in Kabul is a sometimes frightening, sometimes empowering book about one woman's fight to first live with and then escape from her husband's posh Afghan family. Phyllis Chesler draws from her journal entries to retell her ordeal of how her very westernized husband virtually enslaved her when they returned to his native Kabul. Abby Shola spoke to Chesler about her book and the experience. Welcome, Phyllis. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you. In your memoir, uh, American Bride in Kabul, you describe your story about how you fell in love with a foreign student here from Afghanistan. You got married, you moved back there with him, but things took a turn for the worst. Can you describe what happened? 
Well, what happened is very typical. He didn't tell me how backward the country really was, and this is 1961. Wow. And uh, we were very sophisticated. He was very westernized. And when we landed, that is when I discovered, number one, that his father had three wives and 21 children, wow. that I would have to live with my mother-in-law, that she would expect me and would pressure me to convert to Islam. But worse than any of this, and worse than the deception from a man who loved me, was the official at the airport who took away smoothly my American passport and said, oh, it's a formality. I never saw the passport again. And it meant that when I ran away to the American embassy, uh, they said, where's your passport? Don't have it. They took it. Well, we can't help you then. Wow. You also describe how your husband basically dropped all his Western ideals and became this different person. How did that make you feel? Well, uh, terrible. I'm very frightened. But to be fair, he was away for 10 years, and then he brought back an infidel bride. Mm. He wanted to have a very plum government position, which he ultimately achieved. And the family was a very wealthy and influential family. So he needed to tame his Western bride. He needed to be sure that his family felt that I would act as if I was born in Afghanistan. I'm not even traditional for an American girl, <laughs> so there is no way that I could accept, for example, customs such as women wearing ambulatory body bags, wow. which has come back in full force under the Taliban. And when I saw women shrouded, you know, like buried alive on the bus when I ran away once, I was terrified and horrified. Wow. And I said, what is this? Oh, well, you're overreacting. It's not, not a big deal. Anyway, it's on its way out, which I believe that the modernizers believed it was. They thought that they would create Paris <laughs> in Kabul or some European kind of modern democracy. This is hopeless. Wow. So in the description of your book, it says, An American Bride in Kabul is the story of how a naive American learned to see the world through Eastern as well as Western eyes. How so? Good question. Um, when I saw my mother-in-law curse and beat her female servants, which was her complete domain, nobody would interfere with that, I came to understand that these female servants were more afraid of being fired and unemployed than they were about being cursed or being forced to eat leftovers or sleep on the floor, which all servants did. And they were on call 24-7 because they were supporting families in the provinces and they needed that small amount of money. This is something that only if you're on the ground and living with the people that you begin to understand. Oh, there's another thing. Polygamy. I could argue as a feminist about why polygamy is cruel to co-wives and to women in general. Seeing it up close, I also began to understand that the sons especially, the co, the half-siblings, are in a dreadful competition for their father's attention mm. and affection and inheritance, mm. and that they are wounded even more or in a different way than the co-wives are. Wow. I've seen both in Nigeria, the servants being uh, treated that uh, way, as well as polygamy. So mm -hmm. I can <laughs> I can understand. Um, mm -hmm. While you were in Afghanistan, did you ever feel like you wanted to just accept the life that you had there? <laughs> never, never, So you never, never gave up hope? Uh, no, no, no. But I became very ill, and there was, I was not allowed to socialize with many foreigners, and when I did, I was not allowed to say, help, I'm in prison, I'm in Purda, I want to get out, because that would hurt the family and shame the family. So I was very monitored and very controlled, and there were many servants, there were chauffeurs, there were posh villas. So when I talk about being held in captivity, it's like being under house arrest in a very lovely home. Mm. But captivity is captivity. 
and you're now a feminist, which is completely the opposite of being a bride in Kabul, as you were. I suspect that my kind of very firebrand feminism, which was forged possibly in captivity in Afghanistan, is one of the better kinds of feminism in the West and in America today. And why did you decide to write this book? What do you want people to take away from it? Uh, well, where, Afghanistan, where I was held captive, is the very place that gave Osama bin Laden uh, asylum after he was thrown out of Sudan and Saudi Arabia. So you can imagine how bad a dude he was. And now, the entire world, all innocent civilians, are held hostage to that brand of jihadic terrorism. But there's another reason, of course, my brush with gender apartheid and with religious apartheid. Now that Muslim women uh, and infidel women living under Muslim rule are in such peril, and the clock has been set backward to the seventh century for so many, I wanted to connect my experience with their far more surreal experiences today, but also their heroism today which is extraordinary. What about some of the women there that are happy with their lives and they don't see anything wrong with being that kind of bride? Well, or wife, I, I should they, say. No, no, they, there were foreign wives who very much enjoyed having always something to do, no burden of being free, didn't want to be independent, uh, large families, always social events to socialize together and maybe going to the tailor and having good food. So if you're that kind of woman who, who feels that in the West you're just kind of nobody and you're not going to achieve anything particularly, then it might be very exotic and very glamorous and enchanting to be married to someone from a foreign country and do things differently. Mm -hmm. And there are many memoirs by Western women who've enjoyed their time in Saudi Arabia as brides. Even if it ended badly, they genuinely enjoyed even being veiled and being kept very separate from men and from the public sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also Western women travelers from the 18th and 19th century who had the grandest adventures. And uh, I've read many of their memoirs. I recommend them highly. They would visit harems and feel so sorry for the women there on opium with passivity and nothing to do. Mm -hmm. And these women, in turn, would see them wearing bustles and hoops and corsets and would feel so sorry for them <laughs> because they were entrapped yeah. and because clearly they were traveling alone without a male chaperone. And that meant that nobody loved them. Wow. That nobody cared about them. Wow. So talk about Eastern eyes, Western eyes. Wow. So how was it when you came back to the United States? How was it readjusting? Well, I tried to tell people that I had seen versions of apartheid. I was on that bus before Rosa Parks. Didn't want to sit at the back of the bus. And I saw these Afghan women in body bags at the back of the bus. And I tried to talk about this. And people only asked me, did you have, how many servants did you have? And were you a princess of some kind? And did you meet the king? Wow. And I found Americans, that means educated Americans, not ready, unwilling to hear anything about the dark side of the wild, wild east. Uh, you get malaria, you get ransomed, you get kidnapped. You die of hepatitis. Uh, these, you have dysentery, which I had. I had two of those things. People wanted to hear the fairy tale side of it. So it took a while until I could find the right voice uh, to tell the true tale. I see. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Phyllis. Thank you for asking me great questions. You're welcome. <laughs> When we come back, a traveling circus that's doing more than making children laugh.
Finally from us, El Suelo El Vertigo y El Vuelo is a short film that explores the work of a traveling circus in Mexico that assists children with their personal trauma. Sarah Pizan spoke with the film's editor, Shehab Mehandust. Thanks for joining us, Shahab. Thank you very much for having me. Before we get started, let's take a look at a clip. Sure. Um, so tell us, why did you and Marie-José decide to make this film? Well, Marie-José was always interested in the kind of like interaction that art and social have with uh, each other. So she was always like looking into that and she was looking around in uh, like all, all over the world for theater schools with kind of like focus on that. And then that was the time um, that she learned about social circus. But then this idea stayed with her, basically this exposure stayed with her and Later on, when she went to a film school in Montreal um, at Concordia, uh, and she enrolled in a documentary class, that made sense to kind of like pick that idea again and start working on that. So basically, the project started that way in a school, kind of like not knowing where it exactly goes and not even knowing if it is possible to do it. Tell us, what is a social circus? Well, social circus is a form of social intervention for uh, children with different kind of either social troubles or mm -hmm. social conditions. So in a way, um, a group of trainers, they take social circus or circus as a form of art into a community. They introduce um, circus to the, to the community and uh, they try to figure out how they can use and benefit from it to solve some of the issues that children have. And what about this particular circus in Mexico, right? Yeah, this so. is in Mexico. And what is particular about this um, social circus is that it's completely independent. I mean, uh, it's funny because maybe as a coincidence, um, social circus was something started, one kind of social circus uh, started in Montreal uh, as part of Cirque du Soleil. They have this program that is called Cirque du Monde. And uh, basically, they have social circus in different cities all across the world and they try to go and identify how they can help communities uh, with this program and then uh, perhaps around 15 to 17 years ago they, they went to Mexico and they introduced this program to the Mexican community as well but uh, very soon the Mexican community um, they basically tried to localize uh, the program and they completely became independent so right now they're running it um, completely by Mexican trainers, Mexican social workers, and Mexican team, basically. And tell us a little bit about the children. Who are these children? It's kind of like hard to answer that question because mm -hmm. I can say they are anybody like you and me, and mm -hmm. they are um, they're living in communities that somehow um, they are restricted for different reasons. Um, and in a way, social circus helps them to expand their imagination and give them the confidence to not remain restricted by whatever the environment imposes on them. And how do they do that? Well, that can be also very different because usually when they want to go into a community, they first do a lot of research, mm -hmm. kind of like knowing if this will work at all or not. Mm -hmm. And then depending on the environment, the, the neighborhood, the, the community, and like all the, you know, like elements, they decide how to go there. For example, there was one community that um, 
social circus went in around maybe like 10 years ago and of course it was very clear for them that they cannot just walk in and kind of like advertise and mm -hmm. say oh we want to work with children the community it was mainly children that they had parents in jail because of mm -hmm. for example um, drug matters or violence or so the the goal of social circus in this context was to first make a kind of respect among children by themselves and then make a kind of interaction and relationship between the children and the parents so but at the same time it was not just easy to go in in this kind of like a little bit rough neighborhood and so they tried uh, to kind of like come up with a creative you know like in a way creative way to just introduce themselves so they just put stilts on and one day from like the mountain which is like beside the, the neighborhood they just started to juggle on stilts and get down to the valley and so people got curious because you know circus it's very fascinating you know mm -hmm. like it always yeah. looks like this impossible thing that you don't know how it happens the idea of being on the air you know like juggling mm -hmm. so people got curious and they kind of like welcomed gradually the the circus yeah you had a really interesting way of telling uh, the story. There was very little narration. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we hear the children reciting a poem. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about this poem and why you decided to go this way? Yeah, I think that also goes a little bit with the title of the film. And I think they're all interconnected to each other. And it's this idea of earth, this idea of dream, and this idea of flying, mm -hmm. and how this flying becomes uh, kind of like possible and it doesn't really have to be something you know like it's it, it doesn't have to be something too big it doesn't have to be it's just like this step forward doing something that yesterday it was impossible and I think the poem is the recitation of that mm -hmm. remaining kind of like connected to the roots to what you have kind of like accepting what it is and instead of kind of like rejecting what is my situation trying to improve that but I think the interesting thing about the poem is um, because poem is a text and when it comes out from the mouth of different people I think it really has different um, kind of effect mm -hmm. and when you have somebody who just flied reading that poem from Pablo Neruda then that's very powerful and strong I believe. And where's this film available? Well, uh, the, the film was distributed for um, festivals and currently it's available on the web, but we are also working on distributing it in different ways. Yeah. And do you intend to make a longer version of the film? Well, that's part of it, yeah, because basically I started to work with Marie-José um, uh, on this project um, as an editor first because I was very curious about her work and I told her that I can contribute in whatever way you can imagine and then it was editing so we started to work together and because editing is also a way of storytelling we really got close in terms of looking at the story and figuring out what are the other possibilities and as soon as we finished I remember the day that we kind of like locked everything and we sent it out for the first festival we shook each other hand and said okay we will continue that and now we are interested more in um, getting closer to the characters, um, the children and the trainers, and learn more about their personal lives and uh, in a way portray that um, with, with the social circus kind of like more in the background. Great. Well, thank you for being with us. Shaham. Thank you very much for having me. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded. <laughs>